Okay, we're live. Okay, so yeah, very great pleasure to uh, have Richard Maros speak today, live from Vermont. And he's going to tell us about resolution of Lie algebraids and quantization. I'm Thank you, Eckhart. Uh, oh, sorry. Okay. Thank you, Eckhart. And uh, I apologize up front for the, uh, my. Um, so I was originally asked, it was suggested that I speak about, uh, oh, my internet connection is unstable. I hope you can't see that. Um, to talk about the B calculus. Now, the B calculus is like 40 years old and things have moved on. So I want to honor that uh, request by making at least the first half of the talk quite elementary um, and basically talk about standard pseudo differential operators <clears throat> to try and make the transition to uh, the B calculus and other calculi of pseudo differential operators. So, um, there are, there are a lot of them now, and I'm not going to try and list all the possibilities because uh, it, you won't find you wouldn't find that very illuminating. But um, here, the basic picture is this equation one here. We start off with some um, algebra. The way I'm describing it is the geometrically algebraic V. So we're on some manifold, which will turn out in, uh, to be a compact manifold with corners. The non-compact case um, is not as nice. You can do everything, but you don't get as, as such nice results. So we have some uh, Lie algebra of uh, vector fields. This is a geometrically algebraic. So I'm assuming both that it's a subalgebra of the um, smooth vector fields on a manifold and that it is itself a Lie algebraic, which means um, that it, it consists of the sections of a vector bundle um, which maps smoothly into the tangent bundle. I'll come back to look at this a bit later on. So um, basically that just means that locally, uh, and it's a C infinity module by assumption, um, by that condition. So if you think the basic uh, point is that it has a local um, basis uh, of a section. So there's uh, some number K of independent sections, independent elements, which locally span it as a C infinity module. Okay, so <clears throat> the idea is that we start off with this, which is representing some geometry, and I'll try and describe later on uh, where these come from um, in the cases I'm interested in. It's not by any means a general Lie algebra, although it's not at all as restricted as I'm saying here, as you'll perhaps see later on. So from this, we can construct uh, the enveloping algebra, just essentially algebraically, uh, by looking at the formal products of elements of V using the, the Lie bracket to identify commutators. And then the main step I want to talk about here is the passage, which I think of as a form of quantization. Uh, it means a lot of different things and I can reduce it to the ordinary form of quantization, but perhaps that's, um, I won't uh, belabor that point, to an algebra of pseudo differential operators, which we typically call the small calculus um, because there's a big calculus. Um, and so the big calculus in general is not an algebra as we'll see later on, but it's rather important. However, it's a module over the small calculus and hence over the differential operators. And that's its actual main use. So let me try and uh, describe this. So the applications, just to um, start try and convince you why it's important. Um, one a class of such Lie algebraids corresponds to the smooth vector fields of finite length for some sort of Riemannian metric, uh, which is regular in the interior of a manifold with corners or boundary and um, is uh, singular in an appropriate sense as you approach the boundary, which makes the vector field smooth because they're finite length. And well, they can be smooth. Um, and, and getting this itself is, is typically half of the problem in a geometric uh, setting which I won't describe very much. But once one has this, then, uh, so when I said the enveloping algebra, I meant this uh, poetically, um, you can get operators acting on sections of any vector bundles in the same way. And so the Hodge operator, for example, is a typical operator one's interested in if one starts off with a Riemann metric. And so the general idea is that uh, the Hodge operator is a differential operator for the Laplacian, if you prefer, 
um, and we can construct a generalized inverse for it under good circumstances, which is in this large calculus um, of operators. And so you understand the boundedness properties of these operators. From this, you get the boundary behavior or the regularity behavior of differential forms, and hence you get a Hodge theorem. And that's the general uh, aim of the, one of the aims of the process. But let me try and describe, not, I won't have time to do too much of that. Okay, so let me start in some sense at the very beginning uh, with a non-example, uh, just to make sure that people are on the same page. Uh, so let's start off with just with a, with a uh, finite dimensional real vector space, which you can of course take to be Rn, but I want to think at least of the linear group acting on it and actually more uh, properly the affine uh, group as well. Anyway, so we can think of this, of course, as an abelian Lie algebra. If you think of it as the translation invariant vector fields on V, that it is the Lie subalgebra of all the vector fields, um, which are translation invariant. And then the enveloping algebra is just the constant coefficient differential operators, which have been studied for, you know, uh, at least a couple of hundred years. Um, and so these you can think of as operators. It doesn't matter too much what you think of them operating on, on the most natural place is, thing is the short space of V. Uh, and then they're convolution operators. So the constant coefficient, they're translation invariant, they're automatically convolution operators. And the convolution kernel, you can identify as typically done with P itself. Um, and so for the identity, for example, um, the, con the convolution kernel, is the delta function. So it's an element, it's a distribution on uh, V, uh, which is supported at the origin. So it's tempered, but it's compactly supported, of course. It's technically a density rather than a function, but that's precisely what you need in order to make the convolution work. So densities will appear, but these are um, not significant. And then indeed the kernel in general, since uh, is just the action of, of uh, the constant coefficient operator on delta. So what you get when you do this is you get all of the delta distribution, all the, the delta distributions at the origin in the vector space V. So that's what the constant coefficient, what the ring of constant coefficient differential operators looks like. It's those um, uh, distributions under convolution. Now um, we can generalize that, and this is one form of this is the extension or, or quantization in some sense. Um, if we think of the, so these are polynomials. Um, so you can think of the Fourier transform here. Oops, now where do I go? What have I done here? If you see my incompetence. So the Fourier transform from V, the Fourier transform maps these temp, the tempered distributions on V, distributional densities to actually true tempered distributions on V star. And this maps all of these uh, delta distributions precisely to the polynomials, which are basically the same polynomial as you get. Uh, this is how you realize, or one way of realizing the identification with the polynomials. So uh, you can think of these, of course, as polynomials on V star. And then the idea is that we replace this, uh, and this is a very old idea, uh, replace this by a larger ring. Here, what I want to talk about is that of, of the classical symbols, uh, perhaps everyone knows about them, but anyway, let me, as I say, let me keep this elementary. So one way to think about the classical symbols is that you take the radial compactification of V to a ball. So um, that's V bar, or, and I'm going to apply this to V star, but any, any real vector space. And what this consists of is a compact manifold with boundary, a, a closed ball, where the boundary is actually the sphere of V. So it's uh, V minus the origin modulo its R plus action. It's the homogeneity sphere of uh, V. Structure is precisely that. There's a unique smooth structure such that the polynomials um, generate over C infinity of all the, the Laurent functions. So um, since it's now a manifold with boundary, we can think of a function X which is smooth on V bar and vanishes simply at the boundary. You can take it, for example, to be one plus mod X squared square root uh, to the minus one, um, a radial function, the inverse of a radial function near infinity. So this exists and then the polynomials are contained in the C infinity functions on the closed ball um, with a weight 
which is just the homogeneity or the leading homogeneity rather of the polynomial, of the degree of the polynomial, negative polynomial. And then the, this precisely is the space of classical symbols uh, of order K. Um, and so we just replace the polynomials by this larger space, much, much larger, of course. The polynomials of degree K are finite dimensional. This is a big infinite dimensional space, but a very nice one of um, asymptotically homogeneous functions. And so these are the classical symbols. And so in a certain sense, that's quantization. It's not perhaps the usual way of thinking about quantization, but it's related to it. Okay, so as I say, we just uh, apply uh, this construction to V star and uh, because that's where our polynomials are. Um, and then we get a ring of functions which acting multiplicatively on the Schwartz space, if you like, of V star. Um, and so we can take the inverse Fourier transform and uh, we get uh, a class, a, a convolution ring on V. Uh, and that's exactly what this space, the uh, convolution ring, which is the inverse image under the Fourier transform of the multiplicative of ring, which is just these. It's, of course, it's a uh, filtered ring, the, the degrees add. But for any one polynomial, it's finite. Okay, so any one degree is finite. So that's what the pseudo differential operator, the constant coefficient pseudo differential operators on V are. They're the convolution uh, ring form this way. So of course, it's important to understand what the kernels we've, we've got this way are. It's quite elementary uh, to see what they are. They are called the classical kernel distributions at the origin of V. So they're just the inverse Fourier transforms of the classical symbols. And a little bit of uh, elementary analysis will show you <laughs> that they are smooth outside the origin. They're only singular at the origin. Uh, and in fact, they decay rapidly with all derivatives and infinity. So they're, as it were, Schwartz functions uh, on V uh, plus uh, a singularity at the origin, where the singularity at the origin is extremely special. Um, it's not quite homogeneous or, or really not quite a sum of homogeneous terms. It's quasi-homogeneous. Um, which I won't explain, but it just means that it's annihilated by essentially by uh, some product of uh, shifted radial vector fields. And so this includes things such as log of mod V, um, which is sort of an obvious example. So this is the, um, this is actually homogeneous, uh, quasi homogeneous at degree zero, because if you differentiate, if you think of V as X, if you differentiate with respect to X dx, you'll see that you get one or a half or so one, I think. Anyway, so the, the, it's um, homogeneous modulo smooth functions. That's why the quasi homogeneous. So this, of course, is not um, a, an element of this kernel because it's big at infinity. Um, if you cut it off outside the origin, then it will be one of these kernels in the small calculus. But that's precisely what this big space on the right here is. It's supposed to contain things like this. So um, these ideas really go back a long way um, if you look at the literature. So this space consists of these, these convolution operators, plus really the thing of which this is the inverse Fourier transform. Now it's convenient, so that wouldn't include mod V because mod, log mod V is not quite um, homogeneous, but so that E here, gives you the freedom to include multiplicities and powers at infinity. I won't discuss this, but it's just like a divisor with multiplicities. So that's what this um, module is for. Um, it's basically, that's what the difference between the big calculus and the small calculus is. We have terms, uh, big terms at the boundary, uh, whereas the singularity of the origin is unchanged. And so you can see why this is important if you think about the convolution of properties of the Laplacian. So of course I didn't say, but this is the fundamental solution up to constant of the Laplacian on R2. And so if you want to understand its action as a convolution operator, uh, it's an element of this and you want to understand the boundedness of that. And that's, it's, it's this that we're trying to uh, generalize. Well, we succeed in generalizing, we continue to generalize. Okay, so as I say, this E is an index set. Um, and or divisor, and uh, not to worry about it, it just allows 
but more general powers and logs, that's what it allows. And okay, so, uh, so this is uh, all very trivial, but um, it, it basically is the underlying process. If I go right back to the beginning here, um, it's the underlying process in this sequence. Here we have the differential operators, which are some sort of delta functions. Here we get, uh, we replace them by some sorts of conormal distributions. And here we keep those conormal distributions at the diagonal and we allow uh, more uh, com complicated powers at the boundaries, but they're all basically homogeneous terms. Okay, so, um, so that's the case, the, the non-case really of a vector space. I'll come back to this case actually in a certain sense later on, although I might not mention it. Okay, so uh, what about, uh, that's the 1940s probably or something. Um, in the 50s uh, and 60s, the theory of pseudo differential operators was uh, from the theory of singular integral operators, which is closely related. Um, so we're now talking about a general manifold so we just take, first of all, uh, we think about the conormal distribution. So we take a general manifold. Um, so this is not quite the way it was done originally, but it's maybe the way it's thought about now. We take a general manifold and we take an embedded submanifold, a closed embedded submanifold, the nicest sort of submanifold that you want. You're supposed to be thinking here, as we'll see, about the diagonal inside the product of a manifold with itself. Then these spaces of uh, conormal distributions are defined. So they're distributions on X, they're sections of some vector bundle if you want, this doesn't matter, everything's like a C infinity module. So this sort of localization or, or twisting doesn't matter. And they're singular only at S, um, but um, they're defined on X. And they include the delta functions along S. Now um, they have this property that they're actually smooth in the direction of S. So I did have a picture here, but I think I lost it. So they're smooth if you go along S and their singular, only singularity is across S. And then the singularity is precisely the same as the singularity of the origin of V of the inverse of uh, transform. So it's quasi homogeneous uh, as you approach S normally and smooth as you go along S. They have lots of nice functorial properties, which Victor, for example, in his book with Shlomo years ago uh, worked out. In particular, for example, if you um, integrate across S, because you're, you're integrating out the singularity, they become smooth. If you integrate in a more complicated way, you get something more complicated in the basis and for example, base and for example, um, so-called Fourier integral operators, Fourier uh, corresponding Lagrangian distributions arise that way. Anyway, but we don't, we can define these spaces for an arbitrary um, embedded submanifold, closed embedded submanifold. Now, the fundamental, the algebraid um, is the space of all smooth vector fields on a manifold. So let me now remind you of the pseudo differential calculus. Um, so uh, I'm taking here to M to be a compact manifold without boundary for the moment. Um, and so this is the conventional case. So now here's our uh, sort of quantization or um, as you'll see it, later on, it's, it becomes a resolution sequence. But anyway, this is the Lie algebraid. The enveloping algebra of that consists of all the differential operators on M with smooth coefficients. And then we extend this to a bigger uh, uh, filtered ring, which is the pseudo differential operators. So I just want to go through the picture uh, of this a little bit more. So they're characterized exactly as I just described uh, on M squared and compact manifold with boundary. We have the diagonal um, as a, a closed embedded submanifold with respect to that. So they have an order, homogeneity order. Um, and we put in, we have to put in a right density so we can integrate, but this is just uh, bookkeeping. Um, and you can do it for any vector bundle, uh, any homogen, any bundle. And so um, you can get operators on any vector bundle. Okay, so uh, that's what this space is. It's the conormal distribution. Now, of course, um, the most important property, well, first of all, we have to think about how it acts 
that's the Schwartz kernel theorem. So um, as distributions on M squared um, with the right densities, these define uh, operators uh, from C infinity to from uh, smooth functions to distributions in general and conversely. But um, here they define uh, maps from C infinity to C infinity uh, and actually from distributions to distributions. And so we can think about this action geometrically. It's usual to write it down as an integral, but we can think of it integration as being pushed forward and uh, we can write it down geometrically. So here's M squared pictured extremely crudely below. Um, we have two projections. And so if you know about your groupoids, of course, you will recognize this as the uh, groupoid of which the Lie algebra of vector fields is the corresponding Lie algebra. Um, so we have two projections, uh, anchor maps, if you want to think in terms of groupoids, um, to, uh, to M uh, from the, on the right factor and on the left factor. I should perhaps have written down the integral. Uh, and then all you do is you take a function on M a smooth function here, you pull it back to m squared, you multiply it by the kernel. So the kernel is a function of both variables, so distribution in both variables. This is only uh, in the right variable. And then you push it forward under the action to m, which it makes sense because this is a right density and that makes it a density along the fibers of pi L. So the push forward is well defined and you get the map. As I say, this uh, projection here is transversal my picture is probably the worst possible for that point of view, but here's the M squared uh, drawn in a skew fashion. And so the projection from R goes in this direction and the projection to uh, the left projection goes in that direction. Both of them are transversal to the diagonal. So uh, when you pull up a smooth function, you just multiply this, the conormal distributions of C infinity module, you get another conormal distribution, um, which you then push forward and then you're integrating uh, along a vibration which is transversal to the diagonal, so you get a smooth map. So this is the action of uh, the pseudo differential operator, or really, I mean, almost any operator. Okay, so, oh, um, right. Um, I'm not seeing, so anyone got any questions? I'm not supposed to see, am I supposed to see questions? Eckhart will interject I guess. I'm keeping an eye but so far there's nothing in chat okay so of yes, course the most important anything. property most important property in all these cases uh, I mean is the composition or more generally module properties here these form uh, an algebra so this is supposed to be m primed of m of course so I've got a massive typo there so um, this is a, a graded composition and it's actually a quality which is sort of maybe an accident, but it, it's true here. Um, okay, so how do we picture this composition? Uh, and that's what we really are after in general, this algebra property of pseudo differential operators. The quantization I haven't described, um, but this is of course quantization in the very strong sense that we're getting an algebra of operators, not some uh, formal expansion. So the picture is basically very similar to the action, not surprisingly. So. Here we've got two operators. Um, so we have uh, a kernel on M squared. So we've got two factors, A and B. We've got a kernel of the kernel of B on M squared, which is conormal at the diagonal on M squared. We've got a kernel uh, of A on this left factor. And these are related by these two projections. So this is the, um, actually I've probably got them backwards here, but anyway, uh, left, and, left and right have never been good for me. So this is the projection onto the right two factors of M. This is the projection onto the left two factors on M. And this is the projection onto the outer two factors of M. So off the central factor, off the left factor here and off the right factor there. So um, we can do the same thing as the action, write down a very similar formula in which you pull back. So this is why the, these are in fact backwards here. So you pull back the um, kernel of B uh, this is, should be S, S and this should be F. You pull back the kernel of B you and you pull back the kernel of A uh, by a different map. You multiply them together and then you push them forward under the third projection. So you have to understand why this makes sense. Pullback is not generally defined, but it's uh, fine for uh, vibrations. 
and so uh, for pullback of the distribution. So there's no, where is it singular? Well, it's singular on the pre-image of the diagonal uh, here, which is one of the three partial diagonals in M squared. Similarly here, you pull this back, you get a co-normal distribution. I, I'll have a picture, I think, on the next page. Um, <clears throat> and then you ask, well, can you multiply these two together? And the answer is you can uh, by, by wavefront set considerations because the singularities of this and the singularities of that are pointed in different directions. And so you can uh, multiply them where they intersect. And then you can push forward anything under a vibration. You have the combination of the densities works out uh, and you get a, uh, a density here. And the theorem is that that is indeed a co-normal distribution on the diagonal here. So let me draw the picture. So this is functorial properties of um, co-normal distributions. So here is the projection on S. So here is the, um, the kernel, the diagonal coming from the right factor, I mean, the right two factors of M. Here's the diagonal coming from the left two factors of M. Uh, when we multiply them, because you can multiply, everything's smooth outside there. So there's no problem with multiplying the two functions here or here. Here, there's a little problem with multiplying them, but as you see, the directions are different and that allows you to multiply distribution. And then the um, inverse image of the diagonal on the outer two factors is this dotted line that goes through. So one of the important things about diagonals is that they do not meet transversely when you get more than two. So this is a clean intersection, but not a transversal intersection. Um, <clears throat> so because it's like uh, x equals here it's, it's maybe x primed equals x double primed, here it's x equals x primed, and here it's x equals x double primed, and there's a relation between them. Um, okay, but nevertheless, uh, the push forward, this is the functorial properties of distribution, of conormal distributions, is a conormal distribution on m squared and associated with the diagonal, and that's the composition formula. And the only part that contributes to the push forward is when you're not integrating transversely, and that's microlocally true. So somehow the only part that contributes is the singularity in exactly the sideways direction here. And so the fact that it's away from the two uh, diagonals means that if you can cut things off in appropriate sense, you get a conormal distribution. And that's it's a theorem that is not normally written that way, but that's the composition formula for pseudo differential operators. Okay, so I'm wasting my time. Right. So that was the end <laughs> of my introduction. Um, and so the idea starting, you know, 40 uh, somewhat more years ago <clears throat> is to uh, generalize this. Um, and this is the way I think about it now. It's not the way it was thought about at the time. And so what I want to generalize is this picture of M cubed and this picture of M squared. Um, and so let me just uh, introduce this notion without quite uh, explaining why yet, but that's, it's just generalizing exactly that picture. That's what we want to do. So I introduce, I'll introduce this as a functorial object. Um, it's really a, a, a special uh, sort of simplicial space. So what we've got is a seek, well, first of all, uh, it's, a, it's a functor in the sense that we start off with a small category, a very small category, namely the category whose elements are, I mean, the, the objects are the integers if you like, but better to take them to be the sets one up to N for each N um, and the arrows are just all maps between them. So this is a sub uh, category of set. Now, when you do the simplicial category, um, you have uh, restricted uh, maps, they're uh, order preserving maps. But here we take arbitrary maps and we do, and we demand more of the comics. So if we let this denote the category of manifolds, so the C is for compact, the phi is for no boundary, because I want to talk about the boundary case, um, then a generalized product is just a contravariant functor from N to M. So this means the objects, we have a sequence of maps, I should have a sequence of manifolds, um, like the products, um, M1, M2, M3, and so forth. Uh, and then we have maps between them corresponding to the maps. I mean, so arrows are now maps corresponding to the all of the maps between Jn and Jm for each n. But it's contravariant, so it goes t'other way. Um, and it is required 
it, we put a stronger restriction on, the, on it than that, which is that um, when the map J from some JN to JM is injective, we demand that the image be a fibration. So a submersion is the same thing in this context of compact manifolds without boundaries. So it, it, this is the contravariant nature. So it's taking injections to submersions. And also we are required to take uh, surjective maps to embeddings. So this is taking somehow surjections to injections. But we make strong restrictions, assume that these are vibrations and embeddings. You can weaken these, um, but uh, this is the uh, picture I want to then describe and generalize. So in this context, there aren't very many examples, as far as I know. I don't even know quite a theorem of all the examples, but the most obvious example, of course, is the products themselves. Um, <clears throat> so if you take the products of a manifold, then the map correspond, and you have a J, which is a, just a map from JN to JM, the corresponding map on manifolds you can see is immediately just the action of J on the indices. So um, this gives a, a, a functor of the sort that I've just described, and it's, it's generalizing the simplicial uh, functor. So what are the maps that you get this way uh, from M between the MNs and MNs? Well, um, you have all the projections off a finite number of factors in there. They correspond to the inclusions, and you have the diagonal embeddings, um, which correspond to the projection. I mean, if you look, for example, the map that takes uh, x1, x2 to, um, sorry, the map that takes uh, 1, 2 to the single singleton, there's only one of them. The corresponding map here is the embedding of M as the diagonal in M squared. So that's what these maps include, all the multi, the, all the multi diagonals embedded. All, and so in particular, all the maps I described above are in here. Even though there's only a finite number of maps uh, at any level, they're, all the interesting ones are in here. And so uh, there are other uh, straightforward examples. Um, the most obvious one uh, is when you start off with a fiber bundle X over M, so this is just a bundle of compact manifolds, and then take the fiber products. Um, so that is well-known simplicial space, and it also it has these properties. Okay, so uh, so for example, if you if you do this, so okay, so um, now I want to generalize this. I I, have, I won't say why we want this just yet, but you can sort of guess. Um, the theorem is actually uh, with this definition. Uh, it's sort of trivial that all of this works <laughs> is the theorem that from such an ob object you get a class of operators by taking the uh, conormal distributions at the image of the diagonal and um, proceeding. All the, all the theorems go through. It's not quite obvious why the transversality conditions that I've described are true, but they, they follow from these. Um, so that the map, for example, the projections being transversal to the diagonal, which is just an abstract manifold here, uh, follows from these conditions. Yeah, can I quickly ask, uh, uh, the simplicity manifold corresponding to a group point, would that also be an example? If the group um, point is I think it probably is. Um, you know, I never thought about the general case. So obviously, in this particular case, this is generalizing the... the uh, you know, the pair groupoid, um, the product groupoid, I, I think it probably is. Um, but yeah, I, I didn't really check, I must say. Um, probably. Okay, so um, now we want to go to manifolds with corners. So I, I'm not going to try and describe manifolds with corners, but um, they are what you think they are. Uh, <laughs> They're just locally modeled on uh, n-space. So of course, the, the point about which you're modeling can be anywhere in this product of half lines. So the co-dimension of a boundary point can be anything from one up to, to zero up to n. Um, and smoothness, you just take the standard definitions when you know what smooth maps on, on relatively open subsets are. So I, I only insist on a couple of, I insist on a couple of things for functorial properties. One of them, uh, so it looks like a square or you know a cube, but uh, but topologically much more complicated. Um, the uh, the additional condition I insist on is that the boundary hypersurfaces be uh, embedded. 
um, I was going to draw an example, but if you think of a sort of an eye shaped region where which has one corner, you can see that you can easily construct a manifold with co-dimension two corners where the boundary hypersurface is not embedded because it meets itself. So I exclude this. Um, that means that all the boundary hypersurfaces defined as the closures of connected components of co-dimension one faces are themselves manifolds with corners. That's why one does it. Okay, and the maps are not all smooth maps. Uh, they're also restricted uh, because you want them to behave well with respect to the boundaries. I won't go through this, but it means um, that the pullback of the ideal defining a hypersurface is a product of ideals defining a hypersurface. That's what a B map, really, an interior B map is. So it's just a condition that means it respects the boundaries. You don't have horrible things with, with manifolds sort of lying across boundaries in a random way. Um, so B, by the way, just stands for boundary. So, and we and we restrict um, embeddings to be P, where P is for product embeddings. I'll, I'll show you a picture in a minute. This is a stronger condition, the obvious stronger condition, which guarantees that such a submanifold has a version of the Collin neighborhood theorem. Uh, <clears throat> I'll show you what the problem is in a minute. And then we replace B fibration by a weaker notion. So the embeddings are strengthened, the fibrations are weakened. And this um, B fibration, which I could take 10 minutes to describe, but uh, is an analog of the left Schetz maps from, from complex. Now, in fact, the whole of the theory of manifolds with corners is analogous to the theory of uh, log, the log, uh, whatever, uh, log category of, of algebraic varieties or complex places. Okay, so, um, and then we have generalized products in this calculus. So here are the two pictures. So <clears throat> this is a piece of manifold, meaning that you can see that it has a neighbor, a, a, a collar neighborhood. I didn't draw the non-piece of manifold, unfortunately. If you take a corner here, if you look at the product of a line, half line with itself, then the diagonal goes straight through the corner. And it's not a piece of manifold because it does not have a collar neighborhood. And so this, that's what we call a B submanifold. Um, the P submanifold has a collar neighborhood and therefore represents something much closer to what happens for a, a um, right. and particularly you can just extend it across the boundary and everything's a product structure. So this is the, the B, uh, the P submanifolds. We also allow submanifolds of the boundary to be P submanifolds in, uh, with, in the same sort of condition. So you don't require them to be interior. Okay, uh, and then that's a piece, piece of manifold, and here's the B uh, fibration. Uh, what we're doing is we're allowing things that look like that. So they are not fibrations in the, in the obvious sense, um, but they map uh, X1. So this is actually a local model for uh, B fibration. <laughs> any local model, any B fibration actually has a product decomposition in terms of these things. Where, where the image is the product of two boundary defining functions. Otherwise it looks like, like a vibration. So it's very close to a vibration, except that um, we allow uh, this sort of hyperbolic behavior around corners. And the reason is that they occur. Now, the reason we can get away with this is that um, the reason vibrations are important is the push forward properties. And these have push forward properties, even though they're weaker than vibrations, which are very similar to uh, the push forwards for theorems for vibrations. In particular, co-normal functions behave properly under them. Okay, and so the additional thing that, so once we do this, uh, we have a generalized property products in this category. <clears throat> so it's just the same uh, as before, but I demand that uh, injective, the injective J's correspond to B vibrations and the surjective J's correspond to P embedding. So it looks, so in, in particular, this excludes, as you'll, as you'll immediately see, the standard products from being a generalized product. Okay, so uh, I need to have one additional uh, piece of information, which is about blow up. So the, one of the reasons P sub manifolds are useful is they can be blown up. And the reason they can be blown up is they have an, as I said, a colon neighborhood. And so when you blow up something, what you're doing is introducing polar coordinates in the directions normal to the submanifold. So here is the submanifold S. The blow up of X around S is just obtained by replacing S by the inward pointing or the here the whole spherical normal bundle. 
Uh, and so the manifold outside is unchanged. It's not like you're excising a tube around S. You're replacing S by a sphere, and then the outside is absolutely unchanged. Um, so it's a complete analog of blow up in the complex um, setting. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so so what, one of the things this does, I'm just mentioning, it, if you take the Lie algebra of vector fields tangent to a submanifold, uh, vanishing at a submanifold, uh, a little tangent to a submanifold, I guess, um, of uh, dimension, a co-dimension bigger than one, it's not a Lie algebraid, but after you blow it up, they lift to be smooth and it is a Lie algebraid. So there are important commutativity properties of blow up that I'm not gonna have time to describe. So the way, the way blow up arises here is that we use it to construct these generalized um, products. Okay, so now my talk actually starts. The question uh, I was asked to answer is about uh, B calculus. So here's the picture of the B calculus. So now we take a manifold with corners, or if you want, just a compact manifold with boundary. Um, and the space of all smooth vector fields is a Lie algebra, but it's a bad Lie algebra in a certain sense, in so far as uh, it's not the um, infinitesimal, the algebra of infinitesimal diffeomorphisms. It's not the Lie algebra of the diffeomorphism group, because by definition, the diffeomorphisms would have to preserve the boundary. And you can have a vector field here that goes across the boundary. And if you integrate that, you leave the manifold. In other words, it doesn't make sense. So um, the Lie algebra of infinite, the Lie algebra of the diffeomorphism group is the B vector fields. So these are the vector fields which are tangent to all boundary faces if you're on a manifold with corners. It is actually a Lie algebraid. So it's a subspace of the C infinity vector fields, but it's a Lie algebraid. Um, it has a basis, um, not, of course, I mean, it's, it's a non-trivial Lie algebraid. This is a different vector bundle, which maps smoothly into the standard tangent bundle. And so um, the point is that one of the vector fields, the normal vector field has to have a vanishing coefficient when you go to the boundary, but that itself just becomes an object in here. And that gives you a lo local basis combined with the tangent vector fields. And that's why this is, a, is a, uh, the space of vector fields of a, uh, the space of sections of a vector bundle. Okay, um, so the generalized product um, so I didn't introduce this notation. This is my notation for the generalized product, just a bracket uh, two. So this is replacing M squared. So this is the, the objects in the category. So these are the manifolds. There's an M and there's an M2 and there's an M3 and there's an M4. So how is this obtained? Well, um, here is the picture. So the top, top picture is representing M squared. Uh, it's a manifold with boundary. And so um, M squared, M is a manifold with boundaries. So M squared is a manifold with corners. Um, and as I said, the horrible thing about the diagonal is that it goes through the corner. I mean, uh, obviously. And um, because of that, it's not a piece of manifold. And because of that, you have to worry about um, doing things in the normal direction. Because when you try and do things in the normal direction to the uh, di to the diagonal, you leave the manifold uh, instantaneously if you're near the corner. And this means that a lot of things uh, don't make sense. Now, there is a version of the pseudo differential calculus here, which is Boutet de Montvel, um, but it's, it, it's necessary to restrict the elements of the calculus um, and to specialize symbols in order to do that. So instead of doing that, what we do is we resolve. So this is the basic example of resolving the Lie algebra. So we define the um, second space in the generalized product by blowing up the corner. So blowing up a co-dimension two thing is fairly straightforward. Um, if you like, we've got two variables here, an X and an X primed, the normal variables to the boundary and the two factors. This um, is representing, if you like, di um, uh, polar coordinates in X and X prime. Since they're both positive, you can represent the variables here rather simply. You can take projective variables globally. You can take, for example, X minus X primed over X plus X primed as a variable in this direction, and X plus X primed as a variable in this direction. So there's a smooth map back from here. I didn't emphasize this back to the uh, to M squared, which and in which this face is mapped. So this is the 
normal bundle in some sense to, to this diagonal. Um, okay, so it's the inward pointing normal bundle. It has this, uh, this is really a sort of a semicircle if you think about it that way, or a quarter circle rather, is a, in the inward pointing part of the normal bundle. So here we have a nice manifold with corners. The diagonal lifts, so the lift of the diagonal on the, uh, of a manifold under the blow up is the closure of the lift of the pre image of the complement when it doesn't, isn't contained in it. And so the diagonal has become smooth. And not only has it become smooth, well, it was smooth before, but it, it's now a piece of manifold, as you can see. It goes straight across the boundary. And so um, all the things that I've said now work. Um, so this means that uh, we get a calculus of operators. So we, the, the small calculus is obtained by uh, taking conormal distributions with respect to this lifted diagonal, which vanish at these boundary faces, the old boundary faces. They don't vanish here, they're smooth along here. Um, and then the properties of, of, of the uh, generalized product already and uh, everything else. I mean, so I haven't written down the cube, the third space, there's a triple space. Uh, and so forth, uh, making a generalized product, but it follows that we get a calculus of operators. And so why, what is, how, why is that true? Well, um, the thing to understand here um, is the resolution of the, of the um, B vector fields. So the B vector fields are defined, you get them from one of the factors. If you lift the, the vector field, say from the left factor, that's what you normally think of when you're operating with with operators, um, they are vector fields which are then tangent to the fibers of the other projection. Um, they're independent somehow of the other variable. And so they, but since they are tangent to the submanifold, when you blow it up, they uh, become smooth. That's one of the properties of blow up. So if you have a vector field which is tangent to the submanifold that you blow up, it lifts to be smooth. So the left vector fields lift to be smooth up here. So what in what sense does this resolve the B vector fields? Well, they are smooth, but not only that, they form, they, they are collectively transversal to the diagonal now. So before there was some vanishing here in the normal direction. Now we've eliminated that and the lift of the vector field is uh, the normal vector field X dx is non-zero here. You can check this by hand. And so uh, really the, all the B differential operators, the enveloping algebras of that Lie algebra are given by all of the Dirac delta functions along this diagonal, smooth in this direction. That's a consequence of that. The delta function just gives you the identity and then the transversality. So if you like, the normal bundle to this diagonal is the structure bundle for the Lie algebra, uh, the Lie algebraoid. And so this is the general picture of resolution that I'm describing. We want to find a generalized product so that when you, when you lift or you can lift the vector fields from the left side to be transversal to the uh, diagonal, which is part of the setup of the generalized product. And if you do that, then you get a Lie algebra. I mean, a, you get a pseudo differential algebra, which, which um, quantizes the um, Lie algebraoid. Okay. So um, perhaps I should have said more about that in general, but this is the general picture we want of resolution, that we can find a generalized product which resolves the um, Lie algebraoid in this sense, and therefore, because it's true for any generalized product, generates an algebra of pseudo differential operators. The small algebra is defined as having kernels which vanish rapidly at all boundary faces other than the ones that are hit by the diagonal. The big calculus allows power law behavior at these other faces. And so typically when you invert uh, some elliptic operator, you get an element of this big calculus, not the small calculus. Small calculus has its uses um, as, uh, as an analytic tool. Okay, so um, unless there are any questions, <laughs> I will just go through some examples to try and show where we are. Um, so you can work all these out yourself. The, the semi-classical pseudo differential calculus has been around, um, well, you know, maybe as long as the ordinary pseudo differential calculus. In fact, in, in the, in the um, physical literature, they're rather confused 
Um, so this is where you have a manifold, you have smooth vector fields on the manifold. They depend on a parameter. That is the fiber uh, case that I talked about before. Um, but here, uh, so they're just smooth vector fields on the, if you like, on the product, but annihilate uh, the parameter, which means that they're just smooth vector fields on M, which depend on epsilon as a parameter. But um, you have a vanishing factor. And so this is a Lie algebra algebraoid. Well, it's sort of manifestly a Lie algebraoid because uh, this is a Lie, a Lie algebraoid with, um, with the tangent, with the pullback of the tangent bundle of M as the structure bundle. And if you put an epsilon in front of it, that uh, obviously you get a basis from a basis. So this is a Lie algebraoid. Um, and uh, its, its quantization is the algebra of, uh, of semi-classical pseudo-differential operators. So it's not trivial. Uh, in some sense, it's not as though you can put the parameter where you want, because uh, when you pass to the enveloping algebra, you, for example, include the identity, which does not have an epsilon in front of it. So the powers have higher powers of epsilon, but the so the multiplication operators do not. So it's not highly non-trivial algebra, which is very widely studied and very widely used. So here's a picture of the resolution of the semi-classical. So I just understand, uh, is the, the epsilon like an h-bar? H-bar, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely, h-bar. So epsilon is going to zero. So when, when epsilon is positive, you're just looking at smooth families and nothing much is going on. But the, um, what happens is epsilon goes to zero. Uh, is what you want to understand. So it's, of course, got enormous applications, which I <laughs> won't try and discuss, but it's also used to discuss high um, energy behavior and all sorts of things. Okay, um, <clears throat> so what's the corresponding resolution? Well, I'm not going to try and draw everything, <clears throat> but the single space is M. Well, not M, but it's zero, one cross M. That's the single space. What's the double space? Well, we start off with the double space in this sense for parameters. So this is the fiber product of um, zero, one cross M with itself, where this is the fiber. So um, uh, this is the base I mean, and that's the fiber. So um, here, the diagonal, the diagonal on M just has epsilon as a parameter, just goes straight through the boundary, nothing bad happens. But um, the boundary is where the problem is, um, and the boundary of the diagonal, so this is the diagonal at epsilon equals zero, is a piece of manifold, so we can blow it up. So if you blow it up, here we get the, this is the double space of the generalized product. Um, and now the diagonal still goes through the boundary. So when you blow it up, because it's in a half space, the, the inward pointing uh, sphere, sphere uh, half sphere bundle of each point. And uh, the diagonal goes through that. So, so the diagonal lifts to a piece of the manifold. And all the, of course, all the other things, all the other properties hold, I'm saying, without proving anything. And there's a triple product, which I'm not going to try and describe. So what's going on is that really on this new face here, uh, this face there, um, the difference x minus x prime over epsilon has become a parameter. And so the co-normal distributions on the diagonal here are singular if you think of them as, as distributions down here, but they do co-normal distributions up here. And so the theorem, which I didn't state, is that when you apply, you, you know this is a generalized product, you apply this, you get an algebra of operators. Again, the big calculus, the small calculus will have all the kernels vanishing rapidly at epsilon equals zero away from this phase. And the big calculus will allow parameter dependence here. So um, this is not normally how the uh, semi-classical calculus is, in, is described, but it's equivalent. Uh, you can do a lot of things with the semi-classical calculus because the parameter is a parameter. So the regularity in the parameter, you can uh, drop uh, almost completely, uh, which is, is one of its powers. Okay, but um, I'm just going through uh, descriptions here. So what's another example? So another example is the scattering calculus. So um, this is very closely related to the translation invariant vector fields on uh, a manifold with boundary. If you take the manifold with boundary, uh, sorry, if you take a vector space and compactify it to the ball, as I did at the beginning, take the translation invariant vector fields and then look at their um, 
span over C infinity of the compactified ball, what you get is this. Um, they are tangent to the boundary, but not only are they tangent to the boundary, they vanish at the boundary with an additional factor. So if you just take an arbitrary compact manifold with boundary, um, you get uh, a correspondingly algebraid, which is the B vector field multiplied by additional factor. Of course, you can do this with any number of powers. Um, it, after one, it, it doesn't make much difference. This is a different Lie algebra and has a different quantization from uh, the B vector fields. And so this includes uh, things that look like the Laplacian, but uh, if you look at, uh, on RN, if you look at the generalization, it's massive in the sense that um, we, there are operators on any compact manifold with boundary, which behave very like the constant coefficient Laplacian on RN. This is not a priori obvious, but it's true. So the resolution I just picture again here, not surprisingly, it passes through the resolution that I described a minute ago for the B vector fields. Namely, here's the resolution for the B vector fields. We blew up the corner and the diagonal is going through. If you, since these vector fields are B vector fields, they do lift up to be smooth here, um, but they are, they're no longer transverse to the diagonal. And it's, a, it's very like the semi-classical calculus that they just have an additional vanishing factor here. So if you blow up the boundary of the lifted diagonal, so this is a two-stage blow up, um, then you get a scattering calculus here. Um, so the diagonal uh, terrible picture is just going through the new face, the front face that you introduce in the second blow up. And um, it's, you know, of course, there's a whole lot of work to say that this gives and higher up version of it gives a generalized product and hence, I mean, by the way, for the pseudo differential calculus, you only need the first three terms of the generalized product. Um, that uh, this gives an algebra to the differential operators. And as I say, uh, on there's a Laplacian, there's a metric on any compact manifold with boundary uh, whose Laplacian lies in this calculus, and such that the inverse of it, um, or generalized inverse, lies in the pseudo differential calculus, the large calculus, and has bounded boundedness properties almost exactly the same as the flat Laplacian on Rn. Um, and that's one of the things you get out of this calculus. So there are plenty more. There's the edge calculus of Matteo. Um, so this <laughs> looks almost the same, but it's quite different. You take a compact manifold with boundary um, and you take the vanishing multiples of the vector field. So they vanish at the boundary. They're, they have a vanishing factor in front of them. So this is a different Lie algebra, and this is closely related to hyperbolic space. And so it has a resolution. Actually, it, this is an example which shows uh, quite clearly that there, the uh, generalized product, the resolution is not unique. There's more than one resolution of this, but um, it doesn't affect the small calculus, but does affect the large calculus. So this allows you to analyze the, the Laplacian on hyperbolic space and hyperbolic like Laplacians on any compact manifold with boundary. Okay, so other examples. So uh, I'm just about running out of time. So there are a lot of examples that are currently being studied um, where we expect there to be resolutions. Um, one that I would like to get people to work on, um, but it's uh, somewhat uh, heavy going, is as I said at the beginning, um, the first step is to reduce yourself to a manifold with corners uh, if you want to apply this sort of construction. And that means in non-compact things are bad in a certain sense. Um, you either have to think about decay as you go to infinity. And if you think about decay, it's typically better to compactify things and then think about um, vanishing degrees or singularities of the boundary. So any real, redu any real reductive Lie group, so in particular, any semi-simple Lie group, uh, and even more generally actually, but almost any Lie group. But the real reductive ones uh, with compact center are, look almost all the same, has a HD compactification to a manifold with corners. This is generalizes the wonderful compactification of Deconcinian processi. It was proved last year by uh, Pierre, who's in the audience, and uh, Panos, and uh, David Vogan and me. So HD here stands for, what does it stand for, Pierre? Uh, Hermitian desingularization. In fact, what it stands for is halfway decent as opposed to wonderful. Um, so this is the natural compactification of one of these semi-simple Lie groups. Has lots of faces. The boundary faces are 
correspond to the um, parabolic subgroups of the group. And so um, almost certainly you can express lots of things in terms of representation theory and so forth with respect to this. Um, this is not known yet to have a, uh, I mean, I, I'd say it's guaranteed almost to have a, uh, for there to be a generalized product lying over it. This has only been constructed very recently um, and only up to level three for SLNR um, by Malta Beer in his thesis. But other examples, Riemann, <laughs> Riemann moduli space compactifies to manifold with corners, the Val peterson metric behaves uh, on it and there's a calculus, which is a pain. Um, there's the Hilbert scheme of points in C2. There's lots and lots of other examples, all sorts of geometric examples. Um, and then there are questions. So I run out of time, there are questions. One is, can one really characterize resol uh, resolvable Lie algorithms? I haven't said, by the way, so uh, one of the things I meant to say, but I didn't have time is that it, they aren't necessarily um, uh, geometric in the sense that sub these you don't have to be sub uh, algebras of the vector fields on a manifold. They, the main point is they have to be more related to fibrations than foliations. I think that's really the, the restriction. So um, there are generalizations that I haven't uh, described. Other questions like uh, if is there somehow a functorial way of constructing these generalized products. For the moment, they're all constructed basically by hand, uh, which is, you know, uh, hard work. Um, we would like to know, I mean, somehow, uh, if you have the double space. So uh, one of the things I did want to point out, by the way, uh, but I forgot to put it in the notes, is that um, one of the things is the question about the relationship to groupoids. And um, this compactification in the B case um, is not a groupoid over M. So in the usual case, as I said, the, the standard calculus of pseudo-differential calculus somehow corresponds to the groupoid M squared over M in the boundaryless case. This is not a groupoid over M. Um, and the reason is actually, I've conveniently left the corners out of this picture in my crude drawing. <laughs> the corners are exactly what stop it being a groupoid. So there's no uh, inverses of, the, of some of these elements. On the other hand, it's probably the case that M cubed is a groupoid over M squared, but um, somehow the, what I'm sort of suggesting is that these generalized products are a refinement of a smooth groupoid. There's, I mean, they're not groupoids, but in some sense they're stronger. So you get a groupoid here if you remove the corners. But if you do that, of course, analytically, you lose the restrictions on what's happening to, you know, of course, you can replace them by just saying rapid decay and so forth, which is normally, in some sense, what's done. But um, it would be good to understand the precise relationship between these things and group points. Okay, um, thank you. Okay, thank you. <laughs> now Time for questions and uh, you, you are brave enough. Raise your hand under reactions. I see Pierre already has a question. Or no, sorry, that? that was me clapping. That was the clapping hand. Okay, that was the other reaction. <laughs> yeah, so any questions, please? You can also just uh, unmute yourself and, and just ask a question. Um, yeah. Can I just I can't ask look people in the eye and force them to ask questions? Daniel, okay. Question? Yes. Um, yeah. Thanks, Richard, for the very nice talk. Um, so, I can you say something about the the higher power? So you said you you motivated the the second and third. Well, indeed. In um, the pseudo differential operators. Yeah. But in, indeed. In terms of the pseudo differential calculus, uh, I don't think they they make an appearance. Um, you can see. I mean. Probably, if you wanted to do something, if you want to do something like understand the, the Hochschild cohomology of these algebras or things like that, the high powers mm. would be relevant. Um, it's one question is, uh, you know, if you've got the powers, especially up to order three, do the others follow? This is one question about functoriality. It would be very nice if they did, mm. but I don't know of any such construction. No, in terms of the pseudo differential calculus, I did say it very briefly. You only need the first three. Um, 
the, the fourth, of course, somehow corresponds to some sort of associativity. But uh, I don't know of any use for them here. They are useful in other contexts, um, but not for the pseudo-differential category, as far as I know. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions? Maybe I have a, a question. I mean, there had been some uh, works on, on, on trying to uh, some unify these various calculus due to, uh, uh, I think, De Boer Scandales von Erb Junkin and, and, and this company. Uh, well, yeah, I mean, the relationship between, so you can get a, a pseudo differential calculus on a, on a group, on a group or more generally, as I say, what you're doing really is you're taking sort of compact or properly supported elements and then closing them in a C star algebra sense. Um, that, you know, it's not like I'm saying that's wrong. Um, it's just that these are smooth versions of uh, you know, a priori smooth algebras in which you can understand what's going on. Most of the cases uh, where, I mean, if the groupoid is like this, like the ones I'm, I mean, if the Lie algebraoid is like the ones I'm talking about, then uh, you get the same answer. I mean, you'll get the closure of the, of this bigger algebra, the C star closure, if you do it that way. Um, there are lots of other examples. Um, I, I think this is a unifying principle. That's what I really say. Um, you can, I mean, I, I haven't given you a really a taste of all the possibilities. Lots, and I haven't given you data of who worked on things either because it's too much. But you can combine yeah. all sorts of things. So there are all sorts of transition algebras and all sorts of uh, uh, things like that. Um, I don't, you know, um, working out the precise relationship of generalized products and groupoids, I think, would be very interesting. But I um, don't quite know what it is. Okay. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, any other questions? Two elementary? Um, Sorry. Hello. I had a question. I wrote it. Um, I don't know if. Yes, yeah, please go ahead and hear you, Alessandra. Go I, ahead. I, I, hello, <laughs> I'm Alessandra Frametti from Lyon. Hi. I wanted to know if you can replace Lie algebraids of vector fields by other Lie algebraids. Well, I mean, Lie algebraids, of course, have a vector field component. So this is one of the things I didn't quite explain. It hasn't been totally investigated, but the, the answer is surely yes. Let me just explain why. If you think about the uh, B vector fields on a manifold with boundary, okay? Um, then uh, there's a, a, an obvious uh, ideal, namely uh, if the ones that have an additional vanishing factor in front of them. And if you take the quotient by that, what you get is you get a Lie algebraoid over the boundary, which is not a geometric one. I mean, which has an additional, I don't know how you think about it, vertical direction, a direction that's killed by the anchor, by the anchor map. Um, it's, in that case, it's a simple one dimensional thing, but that sort of phenomenon occurs all the time. In other words, if you look at um, various boundary faces, almost all of them correspond to ideals in the, in the Lie algebraoid and in the um, pseudo differential algebra. And the corresponding quotient objects, which we think of as non commutative symbols, are indeed quantizations of uh, algebra, Lie algebraoids which have non trivial. Um, you know, vertical parts, non-base parts. Um, I don't know, and so we have as you know, we've we've analyzed those a lot because we typically when you invert the thing, we invert some operator, you need to do exactly that. In other words, you need to invert that first because that's like a symbol. You invert that at the boundary, and then from that you get the inverse of the actual operator. So they've been uh, widely used, but I don't think that's been systematically uh, discussed. That's one reason why I put in the Lie, the Lie algebra point. Um, if the compactification of a semi-simple Lie algebra would mean that most of the vertical parts are also some, in some sense compactifiable and probably it can be done. I don't know the answer to the question. You know, they haven't been 
abstractly studied as far as I know. It's just that we know not lots of examples um, because they arise. We call them typically suspended versions of the same thing because they have these additional variables. So a hidden variable. But yeah, it's a good question in the sense that I don't know the answer. <laughs> That's the definition of a good question. <laughs> yeah. the, the, but I have the, thought about it, but I don't know the answer. <laughs> There seem to be some questions in, in, in the chat. I'm, I'm not sure if, if... So, so maybe I should stand out and ask. Yeah, ten time. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So, so, so could you explain a bit more about the corner thing? Why or what stopped it to be a good point? Well, so it's because, so, I mean, of course, the it's just not a direct analog of M squared as a groupoid over M. I mean, that's um, that's somehow the typical example, as I say, of which you know the Lie algebra of the Lie algebraoid of that is the Lie algebraoid of, of all vector fields on the manifold. Now, in this case, if you look at the corners, what they correspond to is one of the points going to infinity, and so you can't uh, compose them. You you get this problem of you know infinity divided multiplied by zero. Is it is it zero or is it infinity? So if you look in into the uh, composition properties, there isn't they're not invertible that's really the point that it's not a groupoid uh, so some some sort of pair relation so you just take the relation you've got you've got you've got maps you've got anchor maps from that generalized product back to m two anchor maps because you do the blowdown map it goes to m squared and then you take the projections and you get maps back to m but if you look at the at the so they're the arrows of a, it's a it's a um it's a functor i mean it's a it's it's a category all right but the question is the invertibility of the arrows. And um, the corner arrows, I think, uh, are not invertible. And uh, so, so do you think? Okay. Well, let me... you, have to, you have to check it, but it's, it's not. So if you remove those, and in fact, in the usual way of thinking about the corresponding group word, you, you remove all of the boundary places. But anyway, if you remove those corners, then everything's invertible and you get a group word. But it's not compact. That's, that's my objection. Um, and uh, so it's not, I mean, it's a smooth space, but you've, you've taken those. And so the usual pseudo differential operators are basically things that are smaller than the small, I mean, that are smaller than the small calculus insofar as they, their kernels vanish near that, those corners. But then when you complete them in some C star sense, you get something which is the same as the completion of the small calculus. Okay, and that a picture I think is quite quite general. But you can always compose them. Composition is no problem. Composition of the algebra is no problem, and so that's because somehow m cubed behaves uh, group in a groupoid fashion over the the double spaces. That's where, although I mean, it's not a groupoid, I don't think. But uh, yeah, you can you can compose them. There's no problem with the composition. Okay. Okay, thank you. Yeah. We were thinking whether it is some sort of higher group, but if there's yeah, no, I mean, it's certainly you know, I mean, since it's a simplicial space, it's obviously very closely related to groupoids. But I don't think you can quite quite no, make not. them groupoids. I mean, they are, and so it's it's a question. You see, they're compactifications of groupoids, and I was trying to make this point. So if you compactify a group, I mean, even if you take the traditional. Uh, um, uh, Decontinue process, you come back to occasion of adjoint complex semi symbol groups. It's not a group. That's for sure. And it's not a groupoid either, in general. So um, it's somehow you've got to you've got to allow more space. And so I think I'm not sure I would say the notion of groupoid is inadequate. I'm not trying to say that. It's just not quite, I believe, the right notion for these things. So here we have a very simple, I mean, simple to state version of, of um, the, the uh, resolution of a Lie algebraoid. Um, but that, you didn't use inverseness in your, your, in your process, did you use inverseness? The process of what? So uh, in, in, in this corner example, the inverse, some inverse does not uh, exist. Right, so the inverse of the, thought of as an arrow to but M, it, is, it does not exist, I think. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But, but, you know, it doesn't, you know, it, 
captures the regularity of these kernels, um, uh, in particular uh, these the, these when you when you invert an operator, okay, which okay, okay, yeah. yeah, if you invert an operator, which is I mean, so these are operators that are like the Laplacian on a cylindrical manifold. Mm -hmm. um, that's an example, and when you invert them, uh, you do in fact get an element of the big calculus, and it has a non-trivial behavior at that corner which you really need to understand. Okay, okay, okay. That's why I think it's important. And because you can remain, it's only, you know, since you can that's recover it by closing the thing, it doesn't matter in some sense. Um, but, it, but, it, but it's important uh, that it's compact. Okay, okay, thanks. To me, it's important, yep. Okay? Yeah. I'm happy to talk more about it, but, um, okay. Thank you very much. I think everyone else has gone to lunch today or wherever. Well, there's still quite a few people around, but do, do we have any final questions? Hi, I wanted to ask a quick question. Uh, you know, in manifold with corners, you sometimes... can't see you, you're hiding. Yeah, yeah. I'm hiding. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> That's right. Uh, you know, sometimes with manifold with corners, what you want to do is glue, glue them to, to get a larger manifold. Can you do this with the with these algebraids and also with the quantizations? Well, I'm not sure what context you're talking about. I mean, you see, any manifold with corners, because of this uh, assumption I made of the embedding embeddability, I mean, the fact that the boundary hypersurfaces are embedded, you can always multi-double it across boundary hypersurfaces and get a compact manifold with without boundary. Mm -hmm. It's always a you know an embedded submanifold with corners. Of a compact manifold without boundary, which is basically, you know, a number, uh, which is just a number of copies of the original space. And if you, I mean, the presence of boundaries, you see, typically, instead of a boundary, you might have an interior hypersurface where something like this happens. The difference of these two categories, it doesn't really exist in complex, in the complex setting, the two categories, where you have a boundary or an interior surface, because you're not allowed to have boundaries in <laughs> complex setting. And um, so, yes, you can, I mean, all of these things can be done in that sort of context as well. Um, so the blow up, for example, uh, instead of doing the radial blow up, you can do the projective blow up. When you do the projective blow up of, a high, of an in, you know, embedded submanifold, um, you don't get a boundary. You do, unfortunately, get a projective space as the cross section, but you don't get it. So a lot of these things can be done in that category. Um, typically, it's not particularly, I mean, so you're sort of thinking of transmission problems across hypersurfaces and things like that. Typically, it uh, doesn't help very much because you typically won't expect to get things being smooth across the boundary of you know, the transition faces anyway. So making them boundaries doesn't lose you much. But yeah, it is. It's a different category, but it all everything goes through in the other category, basically. Okay, does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, I think so. Thank you. You still have any further questions? Well, it well is... your audience is more responsive than my students, that's for sure. Yeah, okay, yeah. So if it's not the case, let's thank uh, Richard again. Well, thank you. And announce next week's speaker is going to be Sergei Tapashnikov. Thanks, Sergei. Thank you. Thanks, <laughs> yeah, Richard. Hi. Yeah, thanks, Richard. Hi, thanks, Nikita. <laughs> Hi. Who was that? Hi. Hi. Hi, Victor. I think he's gone. Hello, no, Victor is still here. Hello, Victor. <laughs> yeah, Victor.